This lecture is about splenomegaly and hypersplenism by Dr. Isham al akkad Professor of General Surgery, Ain Shams Medical School. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to recall common causes of splenomegaly and hypersplenism, identify the causes which are amenable to splenectomy, and explain the long-term complications of splenectomy and how to avoid and treat. In the list to follow, you will find causes where splenectomy might be needed labeled by stars. Causes with no label need no splenectomy. One star means sometimes, but not common. Two stars mean usually indicated, and three stars mean indicated in almost all cases. Infective causes may be bacterial, spiroketal, viral, protozoal, or parasitic. Splenic abscess may be due to infected thrombus or secondary to typhoid, paratyphoid, otitis media, osteomyelitis, purpural sepsis, and other septic foci. When ruptured, might cause a left subphrenic abscess if contained or generalized peritonitis. Patient is toxic and if left untreated may develop septic shock. Percutaneous drainage is usually successful. Otherwise, splenectomy is indicated. Hydated cysts may affect the spleen as well as the liver or the spleen only. Splenectomy is indicated in conjunction with treatment of cysts elsewhere. Tropical splenomegaly is a term used to describe the splenomegaly of variable parasites or protozoa common in tropical areas. When the spleen is huge and severe hypersplenism develops, splenectomy may be indicated. Egyptian splenomegaly due to schistosomiasis is rarely an indication for splenectomy at present. Idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura is due to antibodies that destroy platelets in blood. The acute form often follows acute infections and is self-limited. The chronic form is of undetermined cause and persists over six months. There is severe spontaneous bleeding tendency, including hazardous areas like intracranially, although the spleen is only moderately enlarged. Patients are initially treated by steroids, but most of them will need splenectomy. Hemolytic anemias, especially spherocytosis, usually benefit from splenectomy. Splenectomy is done for patients with autoimmune hemolytic anemia to avoid long-term steroid therapy or when steroid therapy is ineffective. Thalassemic patients who need frequent blood transfusions and who developed hemolytic antibodies will benefit from splenectomy. Splenectomy is rarely indicated in sickle cell disease. Gaucher's disease is a fat storage disease and the spleen is usually huge. Splenic vein thrombosis might occur due to acute or chronic pancreatitis as the vein runs behind the pancreas or due to infiltration by a pancreatic tumor. Splenectomy may be done as part of pancreatectomy operation. Splenectomy is sometimes used for staging of Hodgkin's disease when no other extranodal spread is apparent. This was needed to decide for whether the patient will need chemotherapy. As chemotherapy became a rather standard treatment in all patients with Hodgkin's disease, the need for staging splenectomy has declined. Previously, the spleen was considered as a vestigial organ, something like the vermiform appendix, that can be removed without any harm to the health of the human being. Few decades ago, the role of the spleen has been identified and more focus on its importance was made. Thrombocytosis occurs within few days after total splenectomy and may reach high levels with the risk of portal vein thrombosis or thrombus formation elsewhere. Aspirin is given when the platelet count exceeds 500,000 per cubic millimeter. Overwhelming or opportunistic post-splenectomy infection syndrome, also known as OPSI syndrome, 
is a state of liability to severe systemic sepsis with unusual opportunistic organisms. Both humoral and cellular immunity diminish after splenectomy. Children and young adults are more susceptible. The organisms are mainly gram-positive encapsulated cocci, streptococcus pneumoniae, haemophilus influenza, Neisseria meningitidis are the most common. Escherichia coli comes next. Pneumonia or meningitis might develop within hours and progress to septic shock with fatal consequences within few days. Patients are also susceptible to other non-bacterial infections like malaria. For elective splenectomy, it is a must to immunize patients at least 10 days before operation with polyvalent vaccines of pneumococci, meningococci, and haemophilus influenzae. In case of splenectomy for trauma, immunization should be given within the following 24 hours of surgery. Antibiotics of the penicillin group are used for prophylaxis and early signs of infection. For young children, a daily dose of penicillin is usually prescribed until the age of 10 years. Patients must be warned to keep proper antibiotic within reach and to start self-medication immediately with the first symptoms of infection, especially of the respiratory tract, until they seek medical advice. They should avoid areas of endemic malaria and take all precautions against mosquito bites. The risk of OPSI declines after three years, but remains there for decades or for life. Hence, the three vaccines should be boosted as required. Splenography or partial splenectomy is therefore preferred whenever safe during surgery for traumatic rupture spleen. Implantation of slices of splenic tissue into the omentum is another option when the severely injured spleen must be removed, although the immune function is not preserved completely. Vaccination is only 50% protective and does not preclude special caution. Thank you.